Mm-hmm. And I think we're going. Tim Roxborough, good morning, sir. Oh, yeah, you're fixing things up. Oh, look, I'm just adjusting, just adjusting my Obama bobblehead. Show me. Which normally, bring, bring it up to normally, the camera. Let me have a look. I think he's a little dusty. Um, Where'd you get that from? Right, um, um, I got this in the States, uh, Washington, D.C. in 2009. Yeah. And uh, so he'd, he'd recently been elected and life was good. <laughs> um, who, uh, who? I mean, I guess we can never never predict exactly what's going to happen in the future, but um, certainly I think there was more uh, more optimism at that point in time. Isn't it Not fun- that we should lose our optimism. Yeah, isn't it yeah. funny to think that not only, you know, you look back to the Obama days and you go, oh, praise the Lord, but you look back to the George W. Bush days and go, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, well, that's one thing I've, I've been wondering probably a lot of people have who were really critical of, of W., um, during his time as to whether we are being too soft on him now because I find myself wanting to to like him while never changing my mind that the you know the Iraq war was predicated on lies yeah um, that as Larry King said in his book that the, the biggest weakness there that George W Bush had was that he, he wasn't very inquisitive um, you know he was he was a decent man but he just wasn't particularly inquisitive but but is that me being too soft on someone who others would say no he, he's a war criminal yeah i the inquisitive thing's interesting i remember and i'm going to get the quote not right but you'll you'll get the themes that someone once described the difference between clinton before him not hrc but clinton before him william and him as uh george w bush would say i don't have time to read books and mm. clinton would read six books a week that was the yeah. difference between the two presidents. Yeah. And I, I think even hearing just how much Obama read, I mean, Obama was constantly reading. Yeah. Uh, even being so busy to be president, there's still time that, that these brightest of minds still find time to read. And um, and I think that that for just average folks like us, it's, it's a reminder just – find time to read like it is so good for your brain if this is what the smartest people do then then we should at least aspire to try and do better i think with reading but i mean that's for myself i i need to read more absolutely but all that on top of the idea that you know every sign at the moment in my opinion is pointing back towards this complete orange nutter in the white house at the moment likely getting re-elected his approval ratings have never been higher and all he's done has been one of the reasons that tens, if not hundreds of thousands of more Americans are going to die from coronavirus. Yeah, I, I try to protect my, my essentially my mental health, not to over-egg it, um, by trying to fall too deep into predictions that he'll win again. Um, because what makes me nervous is that, that, you know, Michael Moore has been quite open about saying um, things about how he believed Trump Trump would be elected and then would be re-elected. Um, and I, I just worry that that then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, even though the, the job of a political commentator is not to worry about those things, um, because theoretically, once upon a time, people were meant to be impartial. But the world is fundamentally a worse place with Trump as president, so yeah. I don't want to say anything that becomes a self-fulfilling <laughs> prophecy. So that what, makes what, what I hear you saying, Tim, vote. what I hear you saying, Tim, is whatever you think, the world will follow. Is that what you're worried about? <laughs> Something like that. I'm, I'm just worried. You know, I, look, you you know better than me because your knowledge of American politics is so good. But the the last election came down to what a hundred thousand votes in a couple of small states, and and the, the popular vote was won by Hillary Clinton by mm-hmm. three million. Mm-hmm. Um, but any person who thinks, oh, what's the point in voting? because he's just going to win anyway, then um, we don't need any more people with that uh, that train of thought. There was a poll out in the last, I wouldn't say yesterday, but I get confused with, uh, you know, was it yesterday our time, yesterday America time, which was two days, anyway, in the last couple of yeah. days, there was a poll that came out that talked about the excitability about your candidate, right? So in other words, it was asking Trump supporters how excited they were about Trump, mm-hmm. and it was asking Biden supporters how excited they were about Biden. Something like mid fifties to sixty percent of Trump supporters were excited about Trump, you know, getting reelected, and like twenty to twenty five percent of Biden supporters were excited. Now, that, in my opinion, is one of the biggest key markers because what it means is those people who would be on the left and supporting Biden in general, 
who aren't excited by him are far less likely to participate than people who... I mean, like, you, you think about your favourite artist comes to town, Tim, you know, and mm. and you're like, you have to see it, so you participate in the concert. Some some artist comes along, you're a bit nonplussed about it, you're like, oh, I've got something else on that day, you know, I'm uh, whether I go or yeah. don't, you know what I mean? And I actually if I think... Get a freebie, uh, if I get a freebie, I'll go. But, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I actually think it's it's you know what i i i'm not gonna say who's gonna win because if we all did that last time and we were all so fucking wrong it was terrible um but i have to say the dems have done exactly what they did last time by hiring hiring putting forward although he's not officially the nominee yet but putting forward uh the same establishment figure that doesn't excite the 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 new base and has the same track record that Although it's all complete bullshit and lies from Trump, he can take a pot shot at. I mean, I heard someone the other day say, um, a commentator say, you know, uh, uh, Trump Trump is racist and he did things like wrote articles about the Central Park Five and posted them. Mm. Yet Joe Biden actually put into legislation laws that put thousands and thousands of extra young black men in prison, which is worse. You know, so he's got this track record that Trump's going to be able to throw back in his face. I, I think that the danger for me, though, of that kind of thinking is that that it leads to the false equivalency. So that, that there's just no comparison. There, there, there might be an example of, of something that politicians have done, which was a maybe a well-meaning law that had disastrous consequences. Uh, in the case that you're referring to with Biden, but the the difficulty is is that that if if that's the one soundbite that people remember, then they draw up this false equivalency that that oh well you know they're as bad as each other and and but that's I what they say, do. Uh, I would say objectively, you know, that's not true. <laughs> I, 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 I looking just on, the, on on that point, I I 100 percent agree yeah. with you, but that's that's not how voters think. They no. do think these guys are as bad. That's what they thought with Clinton and him. They're as bad as each other. They were the two most unlikable candidates in the history of American presidential politics. Um, and, and that's how they think. They don't They don't think nuance. And I, I agree that they're not the same, right? But what I'm saying is Trump with Biden has a lot more ammunition to put the bullshit out there like he did last time and have his base believe it and use that base to springboard off to get another win. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I was in uh, Austin, Texas on election night. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and, and Austin Austin's quite liberal, and, and mm -hmm. my wife and I were catching up with good friends of ours who live in, who, they're from Austin, and they used to live in New Zealand. And uh, at the restaurant we were at, CNN was on in the background, and I, mm -hmm. I heard somebody say, oh, the Clinton News Network at another table. And and I was just, I was trying to have this nice catch up dinner, and I just kept watching it in the corner of my eye, and 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 it wasn't a sinking feeling. I had a, a genuine like tightening of the chest as I right. as I realized he was going to win, and um, I I I, thought, I actually thought I was going to have a heart attack because I just thought this is this is so this is so bad for the world, and that that this is this is actually the worst of, of every human character trait. Yep he has um that that i dislike uh the you know the constant lying the, the racism the the complete lack of general knowledge about the world the, the deep deep and we talk about bush being uh, lacking uh, inquisitiveness well well trump is is kind of that that celebration of ignorance yeah, and yeah. um yeah. and and i i loathe all those qualities um, but I, I remember when I, when I flew back to New Zealand, I, I went straight to a stag do, got off the plane and then had to go to a stag do. And, and so a group of guys were sitting around having a few drinks. And, and then one of them said, oh, gosh, you know, Trump and Clinton, well, they were as bad as each other, weren't they? And I was like, no, they were not. Mm. <laughs> like you, you have fallen into the trap of thinking that these two people were as bad as each other. And, and it was just fundamentally not true. And again, I 100% agree with you, but we are talking uh, as perhaps people who have the ability to take one or nine steps back and look at the broader picture. I don't think that's how people vote. And I mean, yeah. I agree that Clinton wasn't as bad a person, as bad or whatever, as Trump, 
But I think she was a good person, to be honest. Well, you know, I, I think that there are some questions around that, but but I, I think that she was a, a preferred candidate than Trump. But that also goes how badly, and this is what I'm saying, they're doing it again, how badly did the DNC read the public to not realise, let's say she was Mother Teresa, but even if she was Mother Teresa, how the how the the public were reading her because that's really all that matters perception is reality no matter how good a candidate they are bad a candidate they are good a person bad person they are it's how the it's how they're perceived and accepted by the public because they're the ones that stick the stick the name in the ballot yeah i I feel like the u.s is still behind the rest of the world uh, including a lot of developing countries including some muslim countries uh, with how they perceive women in power yeah. And, and I know that that as soon as anyone like me brings that up, um, you know, there are howls uh, against the, the notion that somehow sexism played a part. Um, but I think I think we saw that with Elizabeth Warren, too. That, I mean, this is not to say that, that these are perfect candidates, but but it is to say that, that, you know, when you've got two extremely successful and extremely intelligent, highly, highly qualified women who who poll quite well before there are any notions that they're running for president you know hillary clinton the secretary of state polling numbers were very high as yeah. soon as you're running for president um you know and it's not like clinton hadn't been in the in the limelight she's been in the limelight for years and years and years there, there still seems to be i believe you could you could elect the the worst man in the u.s before you can elect the the, the best woman um but anyway, it, it's um, it's depressing. <laughs> I, I, it's depressing, and, and then and then he comes along. So we, we just need who, who who's the next Obama? Uh, look, I think I think that I can't say you're wrong, but it's also I don't want to say you're completely right. It's like obviously sexism played a part, um, just like but but I don't think it played a part enough to cause the loss. I mean, Warren's a really good example this time around. She this was served up to her on a platter. Had she stayed the line. And, you know, kept her progressive roots. But as soon as she attacked Bernie and said that Bernie was saying, you know, a woman couldn't be president, she tanked because she became a politician playing the game, not believable. Because the whole world looked at Bernie and saw he's been saying this since the 80s. He, he's not, you know, even if it was in a conversation where he kind of went, I think this time round it's going to be difficult to get a woman elected, which I'm not even saying he's there. But even if he said that, he's not saying a woman can't be president. And that yeah. was when she started to tank. And then she went from that to the another extreme. She went from sort of progressive back to centrist. And then she went freaking far left woke by saying she was going to get a 15-year-old to vet her. She was going to get a 15-year-old student to vet her secretary of education. But, <laughs> you know, she actually said this. She said that, that she was going to involve children. Yeah. In helping her select, I mean, then you kind of go, okay, that's the, you know, it's American saying of, you know, American football, but that is the Hail Mary. She knew it. She was down, she was out. Yeah. And, and and now she's ruined her legacy by not getting straight behind Bernie because her legacy was in the progressive world. So many progressive, especially female progressive commentators that I've seen are like, you know, she was our hero. She was the one we looked up to. She was the one we wanted to see be the first woman president. But now she's, without getting straight into the progressive um, you, you know, Lane now to step back a bit. She's now ruining her legacy. She's lining herself up for a for a job under Biden. But I I I think a potential job under Biden in a administration that may never exist is a far worse risk than my legacy of being this powerful female progressive figure who helped change American politics. And she's she's yeah. I I think it's sad. Yeah, I guess um, for me, there was always a reservation with Bernie. I, I've got a lot of admiration for him. Um, and and I, see, I I don't mind. In fact, I admire uh, a lot of politicians like, say, Clinton and, and Obama, who might be described as like, Clinton always said, third way progressive. Now, people might describe that as, as fence sitting or they might describe that as being too centrist. Um, but a lot of those people, I, I still think that, that at the heart of it, you know, their values are, are the ones which um which align the most for me which is when it comes to american politics i always try to, i always try to think you know martin luther king probably the greatest american of the 20th century and and to be on the right side of history um with uh, with what he fought for um is is like the most important thing for me and so mm -hmm. i i think you know where where do pretty much all republicans current 
Republicans fall, they would have been absolutely telling Martin Luther King to, to get out of the way and to stop agitating. You know, so they, they would have been on the wrong side of history then, they're on the wrong side of history now. Uh, someone like Biden would still be on the right side of history for me. So I, I, yep. I, um, I don't dislike him at all. No, and, um, but and I, you're, look, I mean, you're, you're quite right about Warren. I look, and I don't. Yeah. I, I again, it's not like I'm talk. It's not like I'm saying Biden's a terrible person either. But I, I mean, you, you've. I mean, it would be lovely to talk about a bit of our background about how, you know, we moved into talk radio together and that kind of stuff. And um, and so this, the, these kinds of conversations <laughs> were a big part. But I just keep coming back to that idea is that he's a he might be a great person. You know, he might have endorsements from all the other candidates, but. The only thing that matters is how the public perceives him. And I think he's the one candidate of the two that technically are left that has the ability for Trump to spin a narrative that will stick that won't help him get elected. I don't think Trump can... I mean, he can do, oh, silly socialist for Bernie, but what else has he got to throw against him? There's, there's not a lot. What about how uh, there was a strong suggestion that Putin wanted Bernie as the candidate, thinking that Bernie would be easier for Trump to beat? Nah, I, I, I don't buy that. I mean, uh, potentially, if I like, I'm a bit of a poker player. Like, I like playing poker in real life and online, and that sounds like the perfect <laughs> bluff to me. It's like, yeah, you know, yeah. it would be a, it'd be great to run against Bernie. I just, <laughs> I, I actually think Bernie would, because Bernie for, ticks a lot of those boxes that Trump ticks about being a bit yeah. of an outsider. I mean, yes, he's been a politician for a very long time, but certainly not taking the PAC money, not having, you know, um, lobbyists behind, all these sorts of things that Trump ticked the last run. Bernie actually ticks um, on the opposite side and not someone who likes to grab pussies. So, you know, what, what I, I think that, in my opinion, when it, I don't think we're going to know because I think Biden's going to be the nominee, unless, of course, this sexual assault thing takes him down, um, which is very hush-hush in the media at the moment. Um, there are only some outlets picking up on that, but it's a pretty serious story, uh, especially if you're someone who went all in on the Christine Blasey Ford um, situation. Um, but I think it'll be it'll be Biden, and I think, put it this way, Biden is currently up by 2% in the polls over Trump. At this time, Clinton was up by about 13 or 14, and she still lost. Biden currently is up by two. It's 49-47. And how bad do you have to be to only be beating Trump by 2% in the polls? You know what I'm saying? That's like Clinton. How bad did that have to be in the end? No, when I say bad, I, I mean as a candidate, which means you take the holistic view that means you're looking at it how the public looks at her, not how she is necessarily, but how bad a candidate does someone have to be to have Trump win, basically? Yeah, well, I mean, she, she still won the popular vote. Um, I think the one thing that I'd come back to on that is that, that I think it's actually it's it's about more than just how good or not these people are as candidates, mm -hmm. because I, I think that the success of Trump is a societal failure um, in many, many ways. It's it's not just about who he's up against, you know, that, that remove who he's up against and, and look at what it says about us that that people would support someone who who is such a bed of nails of, yep. of appallingness and uh, and i've used that example a few times with um with him but bed you know, of nails idea, of appallingness like it well you know and and that's the thing that like a shark d mat you know you you can which is not quite as dramatic as the bed of nails but <laughs> you know humans can lie on all these spikes yeah and we'll be okay yep um one of the one of those spikes will pierce you yeah and um you know what, what you say about some allegations which i i know nothing about regarding biden well I wow mean, you know for goodness sake it, it's it, you you think of every single day i mean the every day there is something appalling that would destroy somebody else that doesn't destroy trump completely that doesn't to me that doesn't to me say anything about who's up against him it says something about us it says something about the human race that we could be drawn to someone so cartoonishly yep. awful yep well it's yeah. it's it's you know what it was three four years ago was it 2016 the four years oh yeah 2016 2016 it was basically there was a there, there was because you're always fighting for that thirty percent in the in the middle in American politics. You know, thirty five percent on either side is the base, the hardcore base. Mm. They're never going to move either way, no matter what. So the thirty percent in the middle, the 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 center left, center right, the centrists, and the swing voters, 
they're the people who decide the election every time because the other ones aren't going to aren't moving at all. Um, although with the college, uh, the collegiate system, it's a little bit different. But um, there were obviously the 35 percent that said yes to Trump no matter what. Uh, and then there was the Republicans who went, oh, God, this guy is a complete mess, but he's surely better than Clinton. So they voted for him. And then there was the people going, I want to burn this to the ground. I want the system to be burned to the ground and Trump's going to do it. And I think that's how we got in. And I think that you're still going to have – what you're going to have now is at 35% and you're going to have those Republicans who voted for him last time begrudgingly vote for him this time more willingly. And maybe some of the ones who didn't vote for him this time will come across. And then the question's got to be asked, is there enough support for Joe amongst the remaining – let's say we're down to now 20% – to get him from thirty five to fifty five percent, and and I think it's I think it's going to be close, man. I really do. Yeah, I think the other aspect, and we, we don't have to go into this. There's many many things to talk about, but I I think the other one that we shouldn't neglect, or the, when people analyze the whys, uh, shouldn't neglect is the role that that abortion has on this. Yeah, totally. And that that, that I I can see, um, you know, young young Kiwis who uh, I've worked with, um, and then you see what they post on Facebook. And, you know, they're, they're nice people. And, um, oh, look, I'm getting a phone call. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it on silent, but it's hooked up to my computer. How embarrassing. Um, so, so yeah, young young Kiwis who, you know, you, you mix with in, in real life and then you see what they post online. And you're like, oh, wow. Mm. And, um, and wonderful, delightful people to work with. And then you realize that, that they are Trump supporters from afar. But you realize the reason they're Trump supporters is because they've got an extremely conservative idea of Christianity. Yep. Um, um, Trump, who knows nothing about the Gospels, uh, mm. nothing, about, nothing about Jesus, nothing about Christianity. But, um, but because he is the party of being uh, anti-abortion, that is as much as those people need. Yep. I heard a, I heard a commentary the other day, who, were talk, who a commentator who was talking about their parent um, and their, their parent was a democrat through and through and then when roe v wade came through and basically the democrats took the pro-choice position the republicans took the pro-life position although i think those terms are ri ridiculous um because how can you be pro-life and support war you know that's another conversation yeah, for another day maybe exactly um but w became a republican overnight and it was for one issue and i think you're right i think there are a bunch of the evangelical right, the conservative Christians, it's probably the same a bit in New Zealand, although I think our quote-unquote right in New Zealand is nothing like the right in America. I mean, yeah. our, our right, quote-unquote, in New Zealand supported, you know, same-sex marriage in general and supports things like working for families and that sort of thing in, in general. Um, mm. But but there are many people who are one-issue voters. If there was a group who were one-issue voters, it's going to be uh, the abortion issue, absolutely. And yeah. So, so, so that's, a, that's an uphill fight as well. Yeah. Have you heard that example of there's a uh, fertility clinic that's um, on fire and about to burn to the ground? Have you heard, heard no. this, this example? Um, so it, it, it's just it's just one to every now and then if you're feeling brave enough to have a debate about abortion, which I'm essentially never feeling that brave. Um, but um, so there's a fertility clinic which is about to burn to the ground. So the yep. fire is raging in the building yep. and there are all these um, just fertilized embryos, I guess. Um and there's like a thousand of them mm -hmm. so embryos which have just been fertilized sperm and egg boom there they are a thousand of them a zygote there's also, they call it? A zygote? There's also a zygote. Anyway. yeah there's also like a, a three-year-old child um who's in the building too and uh, so does the does the firefighter or do, do you if you happen to be fleeing the building do you save the 1000 fertilized embryos yeah or do you save the three-year-old child and I think all of us, regardless of our opinion on abortion, would save the three-year-old child. Yeah. And and when you when you are presented, or when someone who is extremely black and white about abortion is presented with that scenario, um, they they find it quite confronting. And there's nothing wrong with admitting that all of it is all of it is confronting. I mean, people also seem. To, to want to ignore the fact that you are allowed to have nuanced views on, on abortion. Sure. But I think that, that scenario is actually handy. <laughs> yeah, well, my, my typical response to people, 
because people like labels and I've never ever been good at labels um, I typically say when people are talking about you know where do you sit on this I say well I, I, I'm, I'm not pro-life uh, and neither am I pro-choice because both those terms are now political and I don't mm. want to associate with the politics of it but what I am is pro-person and sometimes when you're pro-people, you sit in the camp with people who are pro-life, and sometimes you sit in the camp with people who are pro-choice. And that's yeah. how I kind of choose to engage in that debate. Yeah. No, I, I think that's that's nicely said. Mm. Hey, um, let, let me let me ask you a question. You, you've you moved to the, the town where my parents live. Um, moved there a few, year, few years ago. Right? Yep. How are you finding Dunedin? I love it, eh? Yeah, I love it. I love it a lot. I mean, to be honest with you... Um, so, you know, work opportunities and stuff can become m more trying. It's a smaller demographic. You know, we're 130,000 people versus whatever Auckland is now, 6.9 million or something. Um, 1.6. Oh, fair <laughs> enough. This is a, yeah. um, but I love it. The lifestyle's great. You know, uh, kids are great. I mean, I've had some pretty massive upheaval since moving down here. You know, I had a marriage breakup and all that kind of stuff. I moved down as a family, then had that all um, happen. Um, which yeah. is for people who know me and people who follow. It's funny, eh? When you do radio and stuff, people continue to follow you even after you kind of get out of it. So for those people, yeah. that's all pretty well publicized. It's been written about and blogged about and stuff. Um, but in general, it's great. I mean, I like the climate. People are like, I remember leaving Auckland and people going, oh, it's going to be cold. And I'd be like, yep. And that would be the comment, oh, it's going to be cold. And I eventually got sick of it. So I said to someone, how much do you pay in rent each week? And they went, oh, 600 bucks. I went, okay, so I'll take your first week's rent. I'll buy some polyprops and a, a and a puffer jacket with it. <laughs> and I'll be warm the rest of the year and you'll still be paying $600 a week in rent. And they were like, oh, that was kind of the end of the conversation. So, But I actually really like the climate. I like that, uh, I'm going to sound like a freaking boomer now, but I like that we have an autumn. I mean, in Auckland, you don't really have an autumn, but here you really do see that change of leaves and that kind of stuff, which you'll know about if you folks are here. Yeah. Um, I like that once a year, twice a year, perhaps depending on where you live in Dunedin, you get snow. Um, it's nice. It's nice. It's exciting enough to have a little bit of a, you know, a fun experience, but it's not annoying enough to stick around and, and be a problem. Um, I like that it's super close to central. You know, Wanaka and Queenstown basically feel like they're just around the corner. I don't yeah. know. There's, uh, when 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 we moved as a family. There was we did have a bit of a list and and it was things like I want a stadium because with a stadium comes events you know so yeah. I wanted that uh, I wanted a university so therefore if my kids were gonna they had the opportunity to stay around if they wanted to didn't have to but if they wanted to uh, I yeah. wanted an international airport and whilst Dunedin Airport doesn't really fit that bill it does fly to Australia a couple of times a week so it kind of does the sign the sign says international it does say so. international yeah. Um, <laughs> And then obviously I wanted to be able to buy a house, um, yeah. so we left we left Auckland with you know we, typical freaking Jaffers. We had a good chunk of money because we'd we'd owned a house for three minutes and it had appreciated a million dollars or whatever happens in the Auckland real estate market these days. It wasn't quite that obviously, but you know we had some capital and bought it down, and that gave us the start that I was able to kind of just start working from home and continue doing what I was doing. And um, my then partner was a teacher and could do teaching and we lived really comfortably it was it was a really good move and yeah continue to love it love it um i also think that one of the things that dunedin's really lucky for is the university i think i've said this before on this podcast um but because of the university we are oversubscribed with resources that perhaps we shouldn't have um you know a, a city of one hundred and twenty-five thousand people we're basically tauranga right and yeah. we're, we're far better resourced than Tauranga. Part of that's probably because we used to be part of the big four, you know, the spine through the country. But also, yeah. you know, you know, uh, Otago University brings in over a billion dollars a year to the economy. Um, and that's not including other institutions down here like the Polytech. Uh, so it could be $1.5 billion coming into this little economy. Uh, I say little because of the size of the population, yeah. which means... It's a bit ironic saying this at the moment, considering we're all locked in our houses, but the bars and the pubs <laughs> and the restaurants and the cafes are here to serve the students primarily, but being a local means you get the advantage of it. So, yeah. you know, I, I, 
I, I, there's not too much that I that I would complain about. But I'm also not one of those people who's turned into you know like the worst person to talk to about smoking is an ex-smoker. Yeah. Normally, the worst person to talk to about Auckland, uh, about Auckland is someone who's just left Auckland. That's not me either. I mean, I've been back in Auckland. My mum passed away 18 months ago, and that year I was in Auckland six or seven times. But normally I'm up in Auckland once a quarter. I love it. Yeah. I, the yeah. traffic doesn't bother me. You know, I know it takes longer to get places. You know, I, I'm I'm a huge fan. And and if I ever needed to move back, I happily could. I don't even yeah. have any. I don't have any plans to move back. I don't want to move back. But if something came up and I needed to move back, I wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, and and um, that's nice to hear because where I get where I get a little bit tired is um, is right. when people expect you to have to apologize for living in Auckland, yeah. or that there's that there's the assumption that if you live in Auckland, it's because you haven't yet found a way out, <laughs> and um, and that bugs me because like it, shouldn't it be obvious to all of us that we're all wired differently? Yeah, that that some people. Um, some people want different things in life and that includes where they live and the size of the place they live and the sort of weather in the place they, they live and, and all sorts of things. You know, you, you mentioned Tauranga. Um, I mean, the Tauranga CBD is a bit of a disaster. Um, and, and it's obvious that there isn't that, that deep, um, at least colonial history uh, there. Um, the Mount is a, is a wonderful place and, and well, you can kind of feel the, that. The that Mount is a wonderful place for three weeks a year. Honestly, yeah. people, that's what people, we lived in Papamore. I lived in Tauranga and across in Papamore as well. And any any person that would come there would go, oh, it must be so great to live here. No, yeah, for three weeks of the year, this is the place to be in the North Island. <laughs> the rest yeah. of the time, it, 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 is, it does feel like a retirement village in that area. And it's not, and I, and I realize it's not because everyone is old, which is the perception, it's that everyone acts old. Like I was down there when I was 27, 28, down there. I'm saying like right. I'm walking from Auckland again. I lived in Tauranga when I was 27, 28, newly married. And all the other people in our our demographic, you know, say twenty five to thirty, were like married with three kids and a mortgage, and we just moved off Ponsonby Road, you know. So yeah. it was that they they acted old was how it felt. So we were hanging out with twenty two year olds, you know, who were kind of straight out of university or still in university, because not not because we were too immature, but because those were the people who were like unattached and unencumbered, which was what we were, as which is what all our peers in Auckland were. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, because I, I grew up in Kuala Lumpur. Um, so I, my family were living there in the 80s and, and I was one when we moved there from Wellington. I was born in Wellington, was uh, one when we moved there and then nine when we came back. And so so for me, I, I like I like big cities. Um, yeah. But I, I, where, wherever I go in New Zealand and if people ask where I'm from and then I say Auckland and then you just wait for it and you get the, oh. it's like, no, 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 no. I like where I live. Yeah. Um, it's, why would it be surprising that if New Zealand as a whole is known to be beautiful um why is it surprising that auckland isn't also beautiful you know and, and there are some many amazing places but but the flip side of that is is that that i love as a as a travel writer one of the other things i do once we can again obviously mm -hmm. not much traveling right now yeah. um is, is to be a champion of the the underrated and the um the misjudged um and yeah so i i I'm not saying Dunedin's underrated or misjudged, uh, but you know I, I love Dunedin, even though the climate is is I like hot stuff. Um, having been in in Malaysia as a kid, but um, I went to uh, Wanganui or, or Whanganui for the first time last year, and wow. I loved it. You know, and the great great historic buildings. Uh, it was once the the fifth um, biggest city in New Zealand, and um, and then its economy crashed decades ago, and there was a blessing and a curse there. The blessing being that the beautiful old historic buildings that, that Wanganui had um, actually got preserved. They didn't get knocked down. A lot right. of them were meant to have been knocked down. Right. You go there now, and this is a, a, a beautiful riverside town with some of the best preserved historic architecture in the country. Nice beaches and then close to some wild, stunning rainforest and, uh, and, and some cool quirky things like this amazing pedestrian tunnel that's underground and um it's a cool place oh, oh the best children's playground in the country really uh, better than margaret mahi's playground in christchurch i think so corfi park um, right. so if if we um if our lockdown ends and we're still not, not traveling internationally forget disneyland take the kids to corfi park anyway i, th I think the, that the, i actually the, think the, the I, point being. I actually wonder if that's actually the the marketing plan for Ian new zealand you know can't go to queensland go to queenstown you know can't go to 
I go in France, Manawatu, go to Fungo, go to Manawatu. Yeah, 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 yeah. I reckon, <laughs> and that I reckon would be the that would be a great advertising campaign for them. Um, yeah. So what? So what are you doing now? Okay. So you're are you still working on ZB? You're still doing those Friday, Saturday, yes. Sunday nights? Uh, no, no. So I do the weekend collective now. So we do Saturday and Sunday afternoon. Okay. Um, That's with and, Tim. Uh, it is with a tim it's not with the first tim so it was me and tim wilson yep um and so we'd done the two uh which was was originally friday sunday nights and then and then was sunday nights way back i'd started that with pam corkery that's right um and so pam's still a dear friend she's like family did Um, she run for parliament was it again is that something she got involved in something else and that was the reason she dropped out uh, yeah, so she she uh, was the press secretary for Lila Hare. Gotcha, um, that's right. And um, but yeah, the, working with working with Pam is one of the greatest joys of my life. Yeah. Um, so I, I I love her dearly. I I don't know if there's ever been a funnier broadcaster in New Zealand who was also as um, as sharp witted. You know, um, I mean, Pam Pam's IQ is through the roof. While also being hilarious, while also having lived, um, you know, a, a crazy life. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll never, I'll never say a bad word about Pam. Um, and um, yeah, then, then Wilson, uh, Tim Wilson, and I um, worked together many, many years, and and we're poles apart politically. Um, right. And um, it, it took us about six months to kind of figure out how to how to be together on air when our outlooks were so so different right um but then we then we actually we found a way to do it and we became really good friends good. um so I, I i have a lot of time for tim um and um now he he was doing six days a week so he was doing two days with zb um with me on the weekend collective and then four days a week seven sharp and he's got three young kids and, right. and so six days a week um including your weekends uh, there's just you know too much so he's um he's back to doing sunday nights on zb um and tim beverage who does um a couple of overnights a week he uh he's now my co-host so yeah and and he's, he's a lovely guy too so no i've been i've been lucky um lucky with my co-host and what about the uh the upheaval in the media scene at the moment obviously what's happening with the shutdown is like I, I'm I'm at the same because outside of what I do here, I actually work in a job I get paid for, um, yeah. and I have clients, and my clients advertise on the radio, and it's like, well, no, let's not do any advertising at the moment because we can't sell anything. There's a bit of a shakeup, and, and and no sport at the moment, so yeah. shock that radio sport is is disappears overnight, and yeah. and from what I read and what I've heard, you know, sources say, basically redundancies meaning it may never come back or the plan is it'll never come back. Is that as you understand it? Um, yeah. I mean, I don't want to say more than, than I should and, and more than I don't know any more than, than has been made public either. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's absolutely uh, devastating for, yeah. for those people at, at radio sport and, and my heart goes out to them. And um, you know, I, I think all of us have to be careful right now not to succumb to the fear of of what this world is going to be like um during COVID 19 and post it um but it's i i must admit that myself you know only because i do a lot of uh, freelance work which um you know right now has uh gone a little bit dry <laughs> monday to friday i mean I'm, I'm a travel writer so obviously i'm not going anywhere at the moment and um but you know, it's there are going to be opportunities, but there are also so many people losing their jobs right now, and so many people scared of losing their jobs right now. That that I think for those of us um, who can, one always try to be grateful for for things in your life, and two, try to help those, try to try to just to help others, even in in self isolation, because when you're in your own funk, uh, a nice way out of it is actually just to pick up the phone and ring someone and see how they're doing. Well, so I think uh, I think if we all do that, then then we'll um, getting through this, but it's going to be difficult. I'll, I'll tell you my story about helping people in isolation short, and, and shortly, but I just wanted to stay on this for a sec because yeah. you and I were working in that building and doing some work on the second floor in 2008. Yeah. So it was then classic hits. Was it still like Viva and I-98 or whatever it was and... Yeah, and yeah, what and what happened? Station, what happened then? Viva, Easy Mix, yeah. What happened then was 
huge redundancies because the the climate or the fell out of the advertising dollar mm. and that was when all yeah. those well not all of them because there's still some left but most of those local breakfast shows on things like the more fms and the classic hits and those things started to get networked is there a feeling in the building at the moment like a, a announcers and stuff really concerned about you know what might be just around the corner in general i mean you can understand radio sport because there's no sport i mean it's a horrible thing but there's not but what about the general announcers what about you know the the guys on I guess Ed B's probably must be pretty safe because that's like the source of news. But do you get that vibe in the building that there's nervousness? Everyone's nervous about their jobs at the moment? Uh, look, I, I, I can't speculate. I also don't want to give my bosses um, any extra reason to let me go. But um, um, look, every everyone will be. And yeah. and I think that, that everyone is uh, is prepared as much as you can be, which is actually not a whole lot. Um for the fact that things things are going to have to change because advertising makes um, makes the world go round. Yeah, the world in which we have lived go round. And one thing that I wonder about the the future after this, and I'm I, I, I'm not giving you any inside gossip or anything because I I simply can't, um, and I don't have any. But one thing I wonder about all of this not just for the industry in which i work or the industries in which i work as, as a travel writer and and uh, radio announcer and various other things um is our entire reliance on advertising yeah so so you know when when you actually stop to think how many careers are dependent on not just that we buy stuff but that we advertise that we have stuff you know that that maybe there is actually a, a bigger shift in terms of how we as a species actually operate because yeah. of this. Is that naive? Do you think to, to suggest? But I, I I wouldn't be surprised if if this is actually a, a genuine moment in time. Do you know what shift. I what I think the problem is going to be? And, and obviously, you guys are a part of the New Zealand Herald, or New Zealand Herald's part of you guys, whichever that works with. And you guys took the leap at the Herald to jump behind a paywall for some content. Um, I think that it's it's difficult because news is free i feel like news you know especially important news should be available to the public but then that's got to be paid for so it's one of the reasons i'm quite happy about uh tvnz and rnz kind of joining up part of me kind of goes it would be really cool to have some kind of bbc akin service here in new zealand that we could have news that's always available to us now, what we're seeing in this kind of model, you know, the podcast world and the independent broadcast world is things like Patreons and that sort of thing. So people are paying for their content. And it's a funny mix at the moment because we're now in a in a time where people are used to doing that with things like Netflix and Disney Plus. They're used to paying for their content. But are people prepared to switch across to paying for their radio content, paying for their news content and not have to be reliant on newspapers it's really hard to look like i, I don't know what I, I i guess i can talk about it because the, the lovely man who i loved and adored and worked with mr holmes has passed on but you know mm. i i well remember part of his salary package was he was purchased a bentley he was he wasn't leased <laughs> he was given a bentley as right. a part of his remuneration package um and so we'll i remember some... the i remember the bentley i didn't i didn't know no that. no it was his <laughs> I, I i got told yeah. by people that was one of the reasons that my I, I couldn't get a pay rise one year and it was explained very carefully by a manager that it was because it was purchased wasn't leased now will someone be happy to think about and look i have nothing against mike hosking but the last time i saw him in a photo he was cleaning his ferrari out in the road of his Remuera house. I have no problems with Mike owning a Ferrari. I have no problems with having a... But is someone going to see that photo and go, well, I'm happy to pay my $1.99 a week to Newstalk ZB? I, I don't know. I don't know. So so I, I think that the only way it, under the current system it can continue on is with advertising because, because of, of that kind of idea. However, you know, is something new coming? is a new stripped down version coming like what i love about america and american radio in particular but it kind of goes into the independent broadcast as well is people don't go into the studio people don't go into the radio station they have their studio set up at home and they just dial in you know imagine not having to have i don't know how big the nzme building is now but when i was there it was i think four or five stories imagine being able to do it in this in, in the on one on one floor 
because everyone's doing it from their studios at home. Do you know what I mean? So I think I think to not rely on advertising would involve a massive scale back. I guess that's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, and and and, I, and I'm not saying to, to not rely on it, but but I'm just saying I, I think you know kind of a, a shift of consciousness to to just realise that. Um, because when I when I say that advertising makes the world go around, it's essentially saying that money makes the world go around. Yeah, and and just to I guess draw on our our humanity, um, and I mean I sound like Jacinda Ardern saying it, just be be more kind, but um, <laughs> but but as, I, I try to think you might also know the, the the basic plot of the the extremely wealthy businessman who. Um, is working so hard so that he can retire on a tropical island and go fishing every day right and so he works 60 hours a week and he never sees his kids and he's wheeling and dealing and and um you know has a massive house is not overly happy but he knows that he's getting to this point mm -hmm. in the future where he'll live on the tropical island and be able to go fishing every day and and then you contrast that with the, the person who already lives on the tropical island who has not much money but if it's the tropics that i know to be as in you know like malaysia where the the soils are fertile and and there's fish in the sea and there's watermelon and papaya and whatever else rice um you know it doesn't cost much it, it doesn't cost much and that yeah. person is not looking at that destination in the future they're they're already there yeah now it's not not to say that, that their life is hunky-dory either i i just wonder whether whether as we go into a global recession that um that we, we may just realign our priorities of what is most important and what we actually need in order to be happy and, and good people yeah. hey um just we'll wrap up shortly because i know you've got a, a baby waking up in a few minutes um i was going to say you were talking earlier about um you know reaching out to each other or people in isolation i started i started something last night where basically we're using zoom uh, and offering people to just come and chat. So putting out the invite on Facebook and Twitter and people can come along and chat and also live streaming that at the same time. So then other people mm. can watch it. But of course, yeah. I was like, I don't really know what I'm doing tonight. And so, of course, someone, of course, thought they'd upload and share their uh, screen with porn on it and stuff. So that quickly oh that quickly ended last <laughs> night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, but since then, I've done quite a bit of work on what I need to do to not have that happen again. So tonight at 9.30, I'm going to try it again and we'll give it a go. And, but that's kind of, I think, I feel like I get my gut tells me what we miss, what I'm missing at the moment. I'm talking to my, my whanau, talking to my, my kids aren't with me, they're with their mum. Um, talking to my kids, that happens to live next door, so it's quite easy to talk to them. Um, talking to my kids, talking to my, you know, my dad, talking to my sisters. Um, but what I'm not getting, what I think I'm missing, and I wonder, and this is what I'm trying to do, is those water cooler conversations, those sort of inane conversations with people who aren't, you know, are you really okay? You know, can I do anything for you? And I'm just provide, trying to provide a marketplace where people can just go, so what's up and so we'll no, give no. we'll give it another that's a really go good point and, and we'll see what it's happens a, it's a really good point and, and and i'll share a quick yarn which is um which a friend of mine from primary school days and through high school um recently passed away and then you know it was my age it was 38 wow. um and leave behind a, a wife and two kids um and he died of bowel cancer and um and so we'd we'd lost touch really you know i think our late 20s and and then reconnected about 18 months ago um through social media and then um and and that, that was actually when we found out that he was ill um and uh, anyway i i i would go and visit him and i would i was burdened unnecessarily i now realize by this feeling that i needed to somehow always have deep and meaningful conversations or that i i, I would somehow say something profound for someone who was terminally ill that and and in part maybe that was that was ego even you know that that i wanted to somehow leave leave my friend um after a visit and to have him go right i've had a an epiphany about yeah. the meaning of life yeah but but um now now my apologies if that, that sounds really arrogant because when i say it out loud it does but i was i was genuinely just trying to do the best by him all the while underestimating how much 
it was actually just good to gather with a, a couple of other friends that he hadn't seen for, for a while, um, but old high school friends, and just talk nonsense and actually yeah, yeah. just have a laugh about stuff that doesn't matter. Yep. Because we, we can we can be so caught up in, in really heavy stuff that we forget that one of the joys of the human experience is getting caught up in in minor stuff. Is being That's a dick. The reason, yeah, it's the reason why Seinfeld was such a brilliant show. Yeah. Is because the the stuff the the uh, man, how do you say it? the minutia the minutia yep. uh, of of life is actually terrifically entertaining. Yeah. And and we shouldn't underestimate that. Yep. So I'm giving, I'll give that a crack for a few nights, and if I keep just getting Pornhub popping up, which I don't think I will anymore because <laughs> I've changed some settings, I'll be like, okay, because I kind of went. If it's, I'm not arrogant enough to say this is going to be massive. I'm like, if people want this, we'll do it. If you don't, there's no skin off my nose. I can be watching a movie at 9.30 at night. Hey, just before we go, I was going to say to you, I had a really interesting thought last night. I remembered back to a radio conference when I was working for MediaWorks, who were then Radio Works, I think. But anyway, it was a conference held in Auckland, and at the concert, it was just after we'd lost the Rugby World Cup to Australia. So I think that means it was probably 99. And they talked about... Um, they go, we, like the managers are up the front as they always are and they were like, oh, we've just had a really interesting thought about you know how to do good content on the radio and it's flip it on its head and they actually were talking about, what's his name now? What do we call him? The, the, first, the first man? They were talking about Clark Gayford because he had just done a yeah. bit on the radio that they heard that they used as an example, which is 10 good reasons why we lost the Rugby World Cup. So we just done that on Channel Z, and um, they use that right. as an example of flipping it on its head. And I've been thinking about that because I've been thinking, I feel like the planet, not the people, but the planet, is getting a month to go. <sighs> and you're yeah. seeing stories all over the place about streams running clear, and mm -hmm. um, all this sort of thing. I wonder. I don't. I'm not going to go radio. Let's do a top ten list. But I'm wondering. What is going to come out of this, this isolation that more than half the world's in apparently right now? Mm. What are the positives to come out of it? And I'm not talking about we'll beat coronavirus. I mean the, the byproducts of it. You know, I was thinking, you know, will we come out here in New Zealand and the cold and flu season will be way down? Because if you've got a cold right now and you're sitting in your house, you might pass it to your housemates but then it won't go yeah. on to anybody else. You know, are, are we going to have a, a cleaner environment, cleaner atmosphere? And I just thought, I, I'm really interested to see what those byproducts are after this, not the intention for doing this, but what they're going to, what they're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people are. And, and, and the idea, I was at a, a talk by a lady named Anna Powell, who's sort of seen as a visionary in, in the tourism industry. Mm -hmm. And she said, we've got to aim higher than sustainability. Yep. So that, that if, if you ask someone how their marriage was going, this is the example she used. If you ask someone how their marriage was going and they said, oh, it's sustainable, um, <laughs> you, you would go, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Um, but we talk about sustainability for the environment uh, as if it's a great thing. And so let's, let's aim higher so that, that you can have tourism operations, which, uh, you know, in the case of, um, uh, say Borneo, uh, Sabah and Malaysian Borneo. So the the government there has um, said and they've decreed that they will not chop down more than fifty percent of the original rainforest. Yeah. Now let's hope that that is true because that rainforest is as biodiverse as anywhere on the planet. Um, but that if you support tourism operations that that's a reforest place um, that that don't add to further loss of ecosystems that support local communities in a way where both the environment and the people are actually improved upon um, the, and, and we aim higher than sustainability, then maybe the lessons from COVID-19 um, will, will be okay. It's, just, it's interesting you talk about rainforest because it's one of the things I was exactly thinking about with this byproduct. And I'm just using my cell phone, sorry to be rude, at the same time. Um, because if Brazil is in lockdown, uh, Brazil president refuses to ramp up COVID-19 lockdown. Oh, well, maybe they're not. I was thinking perhaps that means things like deforestation and that are paused at the moment. And like yeah. not wiping out whatever it is, six acres of forest a day for a month. I wonder what that would do. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's going to be interesting to see. And also 
financially speaking, you can see all the like sports people and athletes and you know CEOs all taking massive pay cuts at the moment to keep their you know respective um, institutes alive. And maybe it's a bit like we talked about earlier about the radio and and being reliant on advertising. If that can come out of this and that can continue on, then gosh, imagine uh, imagine if people who often go from Auckland to Brisbane because it's cheaper than going from Auckland to Queenstown don't have to make that choice anymore. They actually choose to go to Queenstown because it's financially viable because there's been a complete world shift that goes, you know, we actually want people to come in to Queenstown mm. now. And rather than $600 return flights when it's 300 return to Sydney, we, we work out this financial side of things and, and, and that's a byproduct and beneficial to everyone. I don't know. Yeah. Well, we, we, we know that there are going to be an awful lot of bad things with COVID-19. So yeah. there is nothing wrong in trying to look for the positives. And at every at every point in, in the history of mankind, people have had to... Um, have had to make the best of whatever their situation was. There's a great quote by C.S. Lewis that I cannot remember at all, but it is along those lines, you know, which is, and I would say this to talk back callers whenever they were saying, this must be the end of days. Clearly we are living in the worst times. And this is, you know, pre-COVID-19. And, and you know, you try and point out that, okay, well, well are these times worse than living through World War II? Are they worse than, than World War One? Are they worse than the, Sp the Spanish flu pandemic of 1919? Are they worse than the Black Plague, you know, which wiped out a third of Europe? Are they worse than living through the Crusades? Are they, they worse than whatever life was like in the year 653? You know, it's um, life expectancy has never been so high. Mm. Um, and and the number of people living in extreme poverty will increase because COVID-19, but the number of people living in extreme poverty now is lower than any juncture of human history. The, the, the years since World War II have been the most peaceful that the planet has ever had, uh, or since humans were on it. Um, so whatever juncture we've been in, people have had to make the best of it, and, uh, and, and this will just be this will just be no different. I, anyway, this is what I tell myself when I'm feeling down or worried or anxious yeah. hey listen so, yeah. um uh, people want to find out more get in touch with you hear about you you still is radio still happening at the moment oh absolutely so um so yes and and i love going to work so i i, I actually you know as, as we as we wrap up i i don't just want to do stuff from home i i love uh i love company um camaraderie and and i am enormously grateful to the company that i've worked for for you know 21 years and and um you know i'm a I, I consider myself lucky at this this moment that I do actually get to go to work, uh, classified as an essential service, um, albeit with a lot of uh, physical distancing, <laughs> a lot of hand and, washing, and a lot of hand washing. So yes, um, every Saturday and Sunday afternoon, the weekend collective from three till six, um, we I, I write for the Herald. Um, I've had a weekly column for uh, for three years, uh, my travel column. Um, so we're we're just pressing pause on my travel bugs column for the time being. Um, and uh, and hoping to bring that back. How once, can you um, how can you spin once that? Once the advertisers come back. Yeah, no. How but how can, <laughs> yeah. are you pausing that because they want you to or because you got because how can you spin that? Like, is there a way to write a column about you know travels from the lounge or something like that? Is there a way to, to actually make that well, into something? Uh, yeah, you know, I mean we just just revenues are, uh, are down so much. Right. So I, I will keep keep writing, and um, and I've got my my music and travel blog rocksreport .com. Uh, and I was meant to be making a, a TV show, an uh, international travel show this year. We did some filming last year in New York and Boston and Hawaii. Um, well, once the lockdown ends and once we can travel in New Zealand again, I mean, I think the border closure will stay for a, a, a lot longer. Yeah. Um, but um, I'm determined to make a make a show about New Zealand. So whatever our situation, we just have to have to know that we've got no choice but to to put our best foot forward and to try not to speak in cliches. It's that idea of, um, and I always think, what happened to the Iceman? Like, my mum remembers when she was a kid, I remember the story about the Iceman coming once a week because they didn't have refrigerators. And so they'd bring, the Iceman would bring, like, literally a big chunk of ice around, put it in the bottom of what they called their safe, which was their refrigerator, you know? And what happened when refrigeration came to the Iceman? The answer was he either adapted or he disappeared. And that's what we're going through right now. After this is over, we either adapt or we disappear. Here. Um, whatever that yeah. sounds quite graphic but you know what I mean it's like and that's what we and people need to do with work they need to do in their industries they either need to adapt after this during this and after this or they will disappear and I think like I don't mean this 
I, I was being I pa- I'm pausing because I don't want to sound flippant, but that's sadly what's happened with radio sport. Couldn't adapt because there was nothing to adapt to, so it disappeared. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to comment on that, but yeah. I, I think that that with with that understanding that that all of us are, are faced with uh, at various times in our lives of of adapting or disappearing, um, is is that we uh, you know offer love and support to to those who are um, who are going through that. Yeah, and and encouragement, um, and also that you allow people the time to be to be sad you know that that i've I've heard people say a a similar thing about other people who have lost work in 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 areas and jobs where you know the the market and the demand for what they're doing is decreasing Mm -hmm. and and they've they've said it in in, in a flippant way whereas you didn't um but but they're oh well you just got to adapt and and i think that you can you can actually you can still say to people well you you can adapt and and you will um, but it, it sucks right now, um, and um, you know, and I, and I feel for you. Um, and 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 for those for those radio sport guys, I mean, yeah. sport is still so huge, and and the necessity for sports broadcasting has not gone away, um, and it'll it'll emerge perhaps in a in a different form. Yeah, one can hope. Hey, Tim Roxburgh, thanks for joining us this morning. I think I think I hear a baby uh, calling for a duty <laughs> duty diaper to be changed. Is that about right? Um, well, she, she's due, so um, I don't know whether I just haven't heard it or whether this is a mysterious long nap, but I, I should go be a good husband and father. So, um, but, but thank you for having me. That, that's been, been really interesting. I've enjoyed it. And all the best to you as well. Stay uh, healthy and happy and with the ability to put food on the table. Doing our best, <laughs> aren't we? Fingers crossed. Yeah.